President Bush rallies an army of emergency workers and volunteers, giving and getting a much needed boost as he confronts the grave issue of retaliation. Around the world, the horrifying week ends on a solemn note. A time to pause, to reflect, and to remember. And crash investigators make an important discovery that may give Tuesday's unspeakable terror a voice. Hello and welcome to our continuing coverage of America's new war. I'm Jonathan Mann. And I'm Zane Vergy at CNN Center. We begin with the investigation of Tuesday's events and a discovery that authorities hope will hold answers about what led up to the tragedy. Federal officials have recovered the cockpit voice recorder from the Pennsylvania crash site of United Airlines Flight 93. Both recorders from the Pentagon crash site have also been recovered. The cockpit voice recorder is meant to capture pilots' conversations during the last 30 minutes of flight, and the Pennsylvania recorders could reveal whether passengers indeed tried to regain control of hijacked Flight 93. At approximately 8.25 p.m. this evening, the voice data recorder was recovered by investigators in the crater. It was approximately 25 feet below the surface. Uh, it is believed it is apparently in fairly good condition. It is already on its route, in route to the NTSB location to be analyzed. On another investigative front, U.S. Immigration Services have detained at least 27 people for questioning. Authorities are probing thousands of leads, and now the first arrest's been made. CNN Justice correspondent Kelly Arena is following that story. The first arrest has been made in direct connection to Tuesday's terrorist attacks that according to law enforcement officials. Now an individual that was detained at JFK Airport in New York is in custody on a material witness warrant. Now we don't have any more specifics at this point, but a material witness warrant is issued when it can be demonstrated that there is information that's highly relevant to a criminal investigation and when there is risk of flight. Law enforcement sources say to expect much more such arrests in coming days. Now, sources say that at least two people in custody have provided what they describe as very useful and helpful information in moving this investigation forward. The FBI says that it has issued 35 search warrants, hundreds of subpoenas. It has seized computers and other material, and it's following up thousands of leads both in the U.S. and abroad. Sources also say that there are currently 27 individuals in custody on immigration violations who may or may not know anything about the incidents. Investigators have also put out a so-called watch list informing various authorities, including Border Patrol and the FAA, about 150 individuals the FBI says may have information that could be helpful in the investigation. Now, if those people are found, uh, they will be... The Justice Department has released a list of 19 people alleged to have hijacked the four planes. Law enforcement officials tell CNN all of the names are directly or indirectly linked to Osama bin Laden. Bin Laden is the Saudi dissident millionaire who some officials have labeled the prime suspect in the case. Federal authorities are also hunting nationwide for dozens of people they believe may be able to shed more light on Tuesday's events. The Federal Bureau of Investigation has also forwarded a list of more than 100 names to numerous law enforcement organizations. These are the names of individuals the FBI would, uh, the FBI would like to talk to because we believe they may have information that could be helpful to the investigation. In New York, in the dark of night, rescue workers have been sifting through the rubble of the World Trade Center towers. Four days after the attacks, they are still holding out hope of finding survivors under the debris. Garrick Utley is monitoring events in New York and joins us now. Garrick? Jonathan, although the hope is still very much there, I, with each passing day it has to get a bit slimmer for those who are still trying to find out what happened to their friends and their relatives there. One of the interesting aspects about the scene there, which we're looking at, is that um, despite the fact that it's nearly four days since the tragedy, there are still small fires. Uh, 
burning here and there, uh, igniting spontaneously. It just gives you an idea of the dimension of the tragedy, what happened there, the death and destruction. Our correspondent, Alessio Vinci, is on the scene to give us more details. Good morning, Alessio. World Trade Center towers once stood. Looks like a giant Hollywood set, but uh, if the camera uh, zooms in a little bit, no movie has been made there. Everything down there is real, extremely real, beginning with the uh, tireless work of thousands of rescue workers determined to find somebody alive down there, but also frustrated perhaps that what they have found so far mostly are body parts and no survivors. The latest count, 185 dead people, 480, and, uh, sorry, 408 body parts, but everything here and everybody here expects that number to rise dramatically, perhaps in the thousands, uh, and certainly thousands of body bags are at the ready here nearby when there's 10, as, much as, 10, as many as 10,000 body bags are ready. 4,717 are the people still missing and the rescue workers down there determined, as I said, working 24 hours shift, uh, sorry, working 12 hour shift for uh, long, long, long hours in trying to find perhaps even one body down there. They must believe that among those four, more than 4,000 people uh, who, were, who are in there, perhaps one may still be alive, perhaps in an air pocket or underneath a big um, a piece of concrete. There, as you can see from these pictures, the uh, rescue workers, they're working with large cranes, but also some of the workers using their hands in removing some of the debris because perhaps they don't want to try to uh, spoil too much the scene. And as you can see also from these pictures, there is still smoldering. There's still a white smoke and billing out from the debris. The uh, understand there are some pockets of fires perhaps uh, down, down deep below and of course uh, still, still the, the, the steel and the iron is still smoldering. Um, there is, as I said, no real hope to find any more survivors, but still the rescue workers, they're extremely determined to find and to keep digging until all the debris have been removed, has been removed, and then perhaps uh, start beginning to the final count of, of the casualties. More than 13,000 tons of debris has been removed so far. They have been taken from uh, here to Staten Island uh, using some uh, big trucks on that island there, not far away from here. The FBI is uh, searching through it to see any clues. I've heard just now, I'm not sure if my microphone picked it up, a small explosion. It could have been perhaps from one tire uh, of a car that was uh, perhaps uh, 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 taken over by the, uh, uh, by the rubble with the collapsing tower. Back to you, Garrick. Thank you very much, Alessio. And just one sign as to how this operation organization is getting better organized. Right after the explosion on, on Tuesday, when the rescue work started, uh, there were many, many volunteers who flooded in to help with the work. Now authorities here in New York City are saying they don't need any more volunteers. It's all organized. They have their shifts worked out, and it's going to go on for weeks and probably months to come. Zane, back to you. Eric, thank you. Well, President Bush traveled to New York on Friday for a first-hand look at the devastation left behind by Tuesday's attacks. He then headed to Camp David, where he'll spend the weekend meeting with his national security advisors and making decisions about what comes next. John King has more. A first-hand look at the worst of the devastation and a pep talk that included a promise to those pulling the dead from the rubble. I can hear you! I can hear you, the rest of the world hears you, and the people... And the people who knocked these buildings down will hear all of us soon. After his emotional tour of New York, Mr. Bush was asked if he knew who was responsible. We know we got a suspect. But lead suspect Osama bin Laden is an elusive target. And aides say one of the president's greatest challenges is convincing an angry nation to be patient. This conflict was begun on the timing and terms of others. It will end in a way and at an hour of our choosing. Mr. Bush declared a national emergency and authorized a call-up of the National Guard and reservists.
and Congress passed a resolution authorizing the president to use all necessary and appropriate force to retaliate. Senior officials say they do not rule out a first wave of military strikes in the near future. But Mr. Bush is asking his national security team and other world leaders to develop a long-range plan. For example, sources tell CNN the president is asking the leaders of Canada, France, Germany, Britain and other nations to do more to break up terrorist cells in their countries. And asking Saudi Arabia and other moderate Arab nations to crack down on bin Laden's financial supporters and to take a tougher line with the Taliban in Afghanistan. In our response, we will have to take into account not only the perpetrators, but those who provide haven, support, inspiration, financial and other assets to the perpetrators. Mr. Bush also led the nation in a day of prayer and remembrance, with former presidents, the cabinet and the Congress joining in. Grief and tragedy and hatred are only for a time. Goodness, remembrance, and love have no end. And the Lord of life holds all who die and all who mourn. Consoling the nation is another role for a president at times of crisis. And a father who knows the strains of the job well gave his son a supportive tap. Administration sources say weekend national security meetings will focus on options for responding. And senior officials tell CNN they enter those talks with one encouraging development. Pakistan, which borders Afghanistan, has now promised to fully cooperate in any U.S. operations. John King, CNN, the White House. Well, as John King just mentioned, Congress has sped through legislation that gives President Bush broad power to use force against the attackers. The House overwhelmingly approved the measure late Friday, 420 to 1. Representative Barbara Lee, the lone dissenter. The California Democrat says military action will not prevent international terrorism against the U.S. The Senate had already voted unanimously in favor of the resolution. And President Bush declared a national state of emergency Friday, paving the way for the Pentagon to call up as many as 50,000 reservists for homeland defense. The military has already identified the first 35,000 troops to be put on active duty. Mark Potter joins us now from the Pentagon with more. Mark? Well, good morning. The Pentagon plan is to call up those 35,000 reservists uh, to help with disaster relief efforts and also to provide support for those National Guard pilots who have been flying combat air missions uh, around uh, Washington, D.C. and New York and who have also been on standby missions at uh, 26 bases around the country. Uh, the the uh, reservists would also provide security at uh, some of the nation's ports. Among those to be called, uh, we are told, engineers, doctors, intelligence specialists, military police, and others. Uh, officials say this activation could begin in a, just a few days and that at first they will ask for volunteers, of which apparently there already are quite a few. We've had people who are knocking on the doors seeking to help. They want to serve. They want to be a part of this. They're very emotional. We've had to say, wait a little bit. You know, it's, it's, we've only had a matter of hours since this all began. We we're proceeding along the, uh, our way, and now we have the authorization to bring those people on board. Now, on CNN earlier, Senator John Warner said the widespread support around the country for military action is mirrored by the unity seen in Congress. Ten years ago, I helped draft the resolution uh, that uh, George Bush, then president, won the Gulf War with our coalition allies. It was three days and three nights of ferocious debate on the Senate floor, and it prevailed by only five votes. This one is 100 votes. What clear evidence, Senator Levin and I worked on the drafting with our leadership of this, what clear evidence of the unity in the Congress and the Congress speak for the people of the United States. Now, overnight here at the Pentagon, workers at the attack site have been uh, shoring up uh, uh, one of the collapsed walls. Uh, they hope to get that job done by uh, sunrise today so that they can start bringing in, finally, uh, some heavy equipment to remove more of the debris. Now, last night at the Pentagon, there was a candlelight uh, vigil. As people uh, lined uh, the roadways, you can see them here as the workers uh, drove by. Uh, they were greeted by uh, the people standing, uh, standing quietly uh, outside the Pentagon. There also were prayer services here yesterday where survivors of the crash eulogized those who died. Uh, the latest estimate is that 189 people died here Tuesday, 
125 of them uh, were Pentagon personnel. Uh, the 64 others were the passengers aboard the American Airlines 757 jet, which slammed into the Pentagon. Back to you. Mark Potter at the Pentagon, thanks very much. Zane? Thanks, Jonathan. While President Bush has called the foe in America's new war against terrorism a nameless, faceless enemy. And Secretary of State Colin Powell says retaliation won't be confined to the battlefield. The enemy is in many places. The enemy is not uh, looking to be found. The enemy is hidden. The enemy is very often right here within our own country. Uh, and so you have to design a campaign plan that goes after that kind of enemy. And it isn't always blunt force military, although that is certainly an option. It may well be that the diplomatic efforts, political efforts, legal, financial, other efforts may be just as effective against that kind of an enemy as with military force. A public opinion survey suggests Americans overwhelmingly think the U.S. should take tough military action. In a CNN and Time poll, 62% of those polled said they feel Congress should declare war on those responsible for Tuesday's atrocities. 27% were opposed. The opinion poll sampling error is plus or minus 3%. One of the few governments that recognizes Afghanistan's ruling Taliban is neighboring Pakistan. But that country's military leader, General Pervez Musharraf, is now promising support for the United States. CNN's Tom Mintier is monitoring things very closely in the capital, Islamabad, and he joins us now. Tom. Zane, currently there is a cabinet meeting, a joint meeting between the cabinet and the Security Council. This meeting started just about an hour ago. It was chaired by Pervez Musharraf, and everyone in the cabinet is there. It is the last time there was a meeting like this was in July, just before the summit meeting with India. Uh, so this is a, a very unique meeting. They are debating and deciding uh, what support to offer the United States. But in, in the beginning of the cabinet meeting, the president started off by offering a moment of silent prayer for those who were killed in the terrorist attacks in the United States. It, allowing our camera inside, it never happened before that the international media was allowed to attend a Pakistani cabinet meeting, but they allowed it for CNN this morning. Uh, may I first of all take this opportunity to request uh, all of you to join me in a with one minute silence <coughs> in memory <coughs> of the, all the innocent people, the thousands of innocent people killed in this terrorist attack in the United, Nation, uh, United States, the thousands of innocent people from all over the world, people of all religions, and may I also add people of all ages, children, young men, women, and old people. Let us all join to observe one minute silence in, in their memory. I asked the president going into this cabinet meeting if the decision had been made to assist the United States. He said, I'm going to present it to the cabinet and the Security Council right now. I also had the opportunity to talk to Abdul Sattar, the Pakistani foreign minister, and talked about the uh, Pakistanis providing intelligence uh, to the Americans should a military strike take place. He said he wanted to wait until the cabinet meeting was being completed, but he said the level of cooperation uh, for a long time has been quite good. So painting a very positive outlook going into this cabinet meeting. We will probably receive a, a written statement in the next couple of hours on the actual decisions, but there have been several calls between uh, the U.S. Secretary of State Colin Powell and the Pakistani President uh, outlining what the United States would like. The new ambassador to Pakistan, who just presented her credentials to the Pakistani President a couple of days ago, also held a meeting which lasted nearly an hour where she outlined what assistance the United States would like to have from Pakistan. Uh, it is extremely critical. You heard John King mention earlier uh, how critical the assistance that Pakistan might offer uh, should should indeed uh, military action take place inside Afghanistan. Zane? Tom, what kind of domestic backlash could there be uh, of, of Pakistan's support to the United States? 
Well, I think the last time the United States uh, sent cruise missiles into Afghanistan, there was probably a bit of backlash here. There were riots in the street. But this may be different. Uh, most of the, of the leadership that I talked to this morning inside the cabinet meeting uh, expressed horror and outrage at, at what had taken place uh, both at the Pentagon and at the World Trade Center. They said this goes beyond any act. Uh, of defiance uh, in, the, in the name of any religion. He said, you know, they said this is beyond the scope of, of human imagination to do something like this. They called it crimes against humanity, uh, were words that I was hearing outside the cabinet room. So uh, if you listen to the voices that, that were going into that cabinet meeting, uh, there was a, a great deal of concern for what has taken place in the United States, and uh, it seemed to indicate that the, the level of support against this type of act was very strong inside the Pakistani cabinet. Tom Mintia in Islamabad. John. The U.S. is preparing for war. A coalition of nations is forming, and as we've just heard, Pakistan seems to be edging towards it. How's all this being viewed in Kabul, capital of Afghanistan itself? Correspondent Nick Robertson joins us now by video phone with the word there. Nick? Well, John, the very latest in an apparent direct reference to what's being considered in Pakistan from the foreign ministry here saying that if a neighboring country should allow its soil to be used by the United States to attack Afghanistan, then they would have to consider uh, replying to that, they could not rule out the possibility uh, of the Taliban organizing an invasion force to be sent into that country. They didn't name the country in the statement, but it was clearly a direct reference to Pakistan, the debate in Pakistan going on at this time. Also in the statement from the foreign ministry, they said that for a short time, all foreign nationals living in Afghanistan would be forced to leave. There are many Pakistani businessmen who come here to Afghanistan. Pakistan has enjoyed very close relations with the Taliban over the last uh, four or five years. And uh, essentially, the Taliban have really come to rely on Pakistan for all sorts of trade, for food goods, for business commodities. Uh, most of what arrives in Kabul in terms of uh, 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 what one finds in the shops, food, uh, whether it's a, a laptop computer, a photocopier machine, anything like that will come generally through Pakistan. So the Taliban have a great deal of reliance on, uh, on their relationship with Pakistan. And for that reason, uh, they, they would be very threatened by the fact that uh, Pakistan could begin to side with the United States right now. Jonathan? Is anyone there talking about negotiation or dialogue with the United States? Is the tone there uh, accommodating in any way or, or simply bellicose? It seems at the moment, Jonathan, that it's a very defiant position. Uh, the, there appears to be no diplomacy that we can detect going on at this time. Certainly in the early stages, uh, there, there was a degree of diplomacy. Pakistan, we understand, was asked to pass a message to the Taliban leadership. Most likely that message did come uh, from the United States. We don't know that for certain, but most likely that's where it came from. But we've heard uh, of no such talks in the last three days, and, and a diplomacy doesn't appear to be going on at the moment. Last night, Mullah Omar, the supreme leader of the Taliban, in a 15-minute radio address to the nation, really sort of uh, geared them up to expect attack from America, uh, told people that to put their faith in Allah and they would be safe, not to be afraid of, uh, of an attack by America. He also went on to say that people should remember the sacrifices that their fathers and grandfathers made dying for the cause of Islam. So really the nation here appears to be being prepared for attack by America and Mullah Omar preparing the nation to, uh, to repel that, to be very defiant in the face of it. It has to be said that uh, Afghanistan has been in conflict for the last 20 years. So for many people here, the fact that there would be another uh, wave of attacks against the country is, is essentially just a continuation uh, of, uh, of an ongoing conflict. So it's nothing new for them. And for that reason, uh, easier for them perhaps to accept that this, this might, might happen. Jonathan? Nick Robertson in Kabul.
Thanks. Zane? Joining us now to discuss relations between Afghanistan and Pakistan is Wajid Shamsul Hassan in London. He's the former Pakistani High Commissioner to Britain. Sir, thank you for being with us. Let me start by asking you, you heard what Nick had to say just a moment ago, saying that the Taliban have threatened to launch an invasion into any neighboring country that offers support to the United States, be it access to, to ground bases or air bases. Do you think the Taliban is bluffing? No, Taliban... Uh then are not bluffing because they have got uh, extended interest in Pakistan in the shape of various jihadi organizations. So they are capable of creating trouble if Pakistan sides with the uh, United States whole hog and carries on what Americans want uh, Pakistan government to do. So in such a case, Pakistan will have to see, uh, you know, will have to see that there is not a major backlash because uh, the, the Taliban's have their uh, or dozen organizations, Mujahideen organizations, who are very closely liaised with them, and uh, they can really create problems for General Musharraf's government. Are you saying that it could be politically impossible for Pervez Musharraf? No, I think it's, uh, the, 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 the crime has been so horrendous that Musharraf definitely has the backing of the people in uh, extending support of the United States to combat international terrorism. But I would uh, feel that it would have been better if the United States had gone to the United Nations and involved them in an operation that would not look like uh, just uh, a retaliatory measure, a measure to, uh, you know, a measure based on uh, finding an escape code and striking at it. Instead of it should have been a global effort so that uh, more and more people were involved, you know. You could have quietened the streets, you know, agitating the streets in the Middle East. You could have quietened uh, dissent in other countries as well if you had sorted an action through United Nations. How critical a point is Pakistan at right now? It's definitely a very critical point because Pakistan has been the main supporter of Taliban. The army has been uh, looking after them and they have been uh, underwriting their civilian expenses, they have been providing them oil, they have been providing them food. But Taliban definitely is much dependent on Pakistan. And if Pakistan cuts off uh, all these things uh, to Taliban, they will be in real soon. But again, they have already hit rock bottom. There's not a building to look at in Kabul or around Kabul. Uh, poverty is uh, all over. Uh, there's no consideration for sick or the injured. So they 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 are already hit the rock bottom. They don't they don't care what happens to them. Uh, they are in a state of mind where uh, they would uh, you know as Mullah Omar said uh, die for Islam, and uh, more and more you know what my fears are that as international media is, seems to be building it up, uh, we are going to land up in what Samuel Huntington had said years ago, a clash of civilizations. You are going to see revival of crusades. I think that will be the most dreaded thing that to happen to this world if that happens, you know. Can you explain that a little more specifically, clash of civilizations? Why would that happen? Well, uh, oh, if you look at uh, the stories that we have heard in England today or stories from all over other places, the attacks on Muslim buses, Muslim schools, Muslim mosques, and uh, it seems to be uh, you know, the, the, by the perception that has been created is that it is Islam versus Christianity or Islam versus United States. That is not the case. You know, there are two billion Muslims in the world and they are not all terrorists. But the perception that is being created is they are terrorists and that is not a fact. So in, a, in order to uh, create a situation where this sort of uh, hatred doesn't generate further than what it is today, I, I think the world leaders, especially President Bush, should act very cautiously instead of uh, uh, being a trigger happy or jumping to his guns on premises, on uh, just uh, mere conjectures or media perceptions that Osama is the person. Well, you must have credible evidence to prove that Osama is the person. Then only you must convince the world that we have got the evidence and we want to go after him. That, that would be the thing that will create uh, international opinion, uh, the street opinion, I wouldn't say international opinion already is there, media is supporting the Americans, media is supporting anti-terrorist uh, action everywhere, but you have to have street support in the Middle East, in the Muslim countries, two billion people have to be mobilized to onto your sides, 
and that could only be possible, I think, um, if we in, uh, involve the United Nations in the operation in a sort of uh, uh, coalition to take action against Osama or okay. Bin Laden if uh, Osama and Bin okay, Taliban, well, if there is need to be. Wajid Shamsul Hassan in London, the former Pakistani High Commissioner to Britain, thank you so much for being with us. Well, the attacks in the U.S. continue to elicit strong reactions around the world. For more on that part of the story, we're joined by CNN's Liz George in London. Liz. Thank you, Zane. Australia and the U.S. have applied their mutual defence treaty, and Australia will join the list of countries aiding the investigation. A statement released by the White House reads in part... Although our alliance with Australia was crafted under very different circumstances than exist now, the events of September the 11th, 2001, are a powerful reminder that the alliance and our shared commitments are no less valid today. Australia shares our assessment of the gravity of the situation and is resolute in its commitment to work with the United States and all freedom-loving people to combat international terrorism. Senior U.S. officials say they've asked moderate Arab states to prevent wealthy Muslims from sending money to terrorist groups as the U.S. seeks Middle Eastern support for any campaign against the Taliban or Osama bin Laden. Bahrain's foreign minister says he remains confident about relations with Washington. It shouldn't affect American Arab relation at all because we stand as friends, we've been cooperating, and we are going to cooperate to arrest and punish those people and this is not doesn't represent the Arab world at all the Arab world expressed its views the Arab world has, has showed his sad sadness uh, on this uh, this catastrophe so really it shouldn't affect uh, this relation only and make it stronger in the future it's becoming an anxious time for many Arab Americans and Muslims in the United States, many of whom are adding their voices to the national chorus. Muslims have been gathering in mosques and community centers, offering prayers and raising money for victims. However, some, including many Afghans, worry about becoming targets for Americans' anger. Rusty Dornin has the story from California. Arif Armas sold every American flag in his store in Fremont, California, a source of pride for him right now. Arma fled Afghanistan when the Soviets invaded. He believes his native land is being unjustly blamed for terrorism the U.S. increasingly believes was the work of a man from Saudi Arabia. No, I don't believe it is Afghani people. It's just this tourism, Osama bin Laden. Others came here when the Taliban regime took over. Some say the world turned its back on Afghanistan when that happened. And that isolation allowed the regime to harbor Osama bin Laden. The same this terrorist group that is uh, terrorizing the world has been torturing and victimizing, massacring our people in Afghanistan. We have asked numerous times for international help, and we got none. Mohammed Kamosh worries that Afghanis here will be blamed for the Taliban's actions. The day of the attacks, someone threw a rock at his storefront. Maybe something happened to us, something like my kids to go to school, they are under stress, people look at them. That he's Afghan, you guys are doing that. Friday, a holy day for Muslims. This Friday, a feeling of vulnerability. Outside the only Afghan mosque is extra security and local police patrols. While the threats have been relatively minor, there is uncertainty and unease among the Afghan community. Afghani businesses line the streets in downtown Fremont. Many here say those left in Afghanistan are for the most part the poor, brutalized by the war with the Soviets and now the repressive policies of the Taliban. Afghans here fear the talk of war. The innocent people get killed. They should do something. They should uh, talk with the Taliban to get that guy, you know. They shouldn't kill these people, the innocent people. People here worry that revenge for Tuesday's attack may mean an all-out strike against a nation they feel has suffered enough. Rusty Dorn in CNN, Fremont, California. In Iran, where the United States has long been considered the enemy, an unprecedented show of sympathy, 60,000 spectators and soccer players observed a minute of silence at the Tehran soccer stadium before a World Cup qualifying match. Iranian leaders have strongly condemned Tuesday's attacks. A gesture a U.S. State Department official has said Washington would like to build on in the future. 
People from around the world were killed in the attacks in Europe, Africa and Asia. Thousands of people attend services in memory of those who died on Tuesday. Let's take a look. Like a torch, like a beacon, even as we mourn and grieve. For if we are steadfast, we know that no darkness, no evil can ever extinguish that beacon of hope. That's a look at how the world is reacting. Now back to Zain at CNN Center. Thanks, Liz. Well, Wall Street's planning to open for business on Monday. The New York Stock Exchange told its opening bell on Friday. It rang not to start a day of trading, but in remembrance. NASDAQ and the exchange have been closed since Tuesday and the longest shutdown since World War I. And some analysts say the attacks could push an already weakened economy into recession. What we perhaps forget in all this is that the American economy, large though it is, is roughly two-thirds consumer spending. The consumers, certainly from our point of view over here and in other world markets, consumers have been the spenders of last resort. We're now asking them to, to sort of gird up their loins after this to go at it again. I, I think that's possibly a very tall order. And I would suspect anyway for perhaps this quarter and the next quarter that the American economy will skate into recession. Tuesday's attacks have led three of America's largest companies to issue profit warnings. General Electric says its insurance business expects claims of some $600 million as a result of the attacks. Another insurance company, MetLife, says it stands to lose between $250 and $300 million. However, it says it will do everything possible to pay claims promptly. And carmaker Ford reports that it will cut third quarter production by some 110,000 vehicles. That's because transport problems have held up delivery of components. And in remarks that are sure to be closely watched, the oil minister of the United Arab Emirates says that OPEC will act immediately if oil prices rise above what he called an acceptable level. Obey bin Sarif al Nasseri pledges that the oil cartel will take the necessary measures to restrain any price rise above $30 a barrel. The loss of the World Trade Center wipes out a lot of office space, and that means companies already coping with human losses have to scramble for new places to reopen for business. Peter Viles reports. Yeah, I think what we could simply do there is thinking if, it's, if, if we have the space is just put two people in the same room temporarily. Well, I think oh, in, in a cubicle. A cubicle. Cu in a cubicle, yeah. Here. CEOs do not typically worry about who shares a cubicle, but these are not typical times. This is the old American Express headquarters, structurally sound but damaged. Ken Chenault is moving 5,000 workers, some to this new headquarters in Jersey City, others into two larger leased spaces in the Jersey suburbs. Fortunately, all of our core operations and processing are outside of our New York headquarters building all around the world. So we have had virtually no interruption of service for any of our businesses across American Express. 
15.5 million square feet of office space was destroyed, another 12 million damaged, meaning the city's businesses are now looking for 27 million square feet of space. American Express has already located nearly a million square feet for itself. When you include suburban office space, metropolitan New York has 46 million square feet of vacant space available. The problem is finding enough large spaces to replace what has been lost. It is a game of musical chairs right now where uh, the major companies are out really in a, in a frenzy uh, looking for the larger blocks of space. Uh, and commitments uh, are already being made as we speak. Uh, so the, uh, we will be essentially out of large blocks of space uh, by next week. In the weeks ahead, this area will be known as the new and temporary world headquarters of American Express. Today it has a much more important designation. It is a staging area for supplies to be ferried across the Hudson River to those thousands of rescue workers who are still working in lower Manhattan. Peter Vile, CNN, Jersey City, New Jersey. He wasn't looking at office space. He was looking at office space that is now gone. President Bush getting a first-hand look Friday at the site in lower Manhattan, now known as Ground Zero. Amid the rubble of the Twin Towers, Mr. Bush spoke to rescue workers who responded with patriotic fervor. Sir, thank you all. Sir, sorry, go ahead, Mom. Lots of boom. Go ahead, got it. I, uh, I want you all to know it can't go any louder. I want you all to know that America today, America today, is on bended knee in prayer for the people whose lives were lost here, for the workers who work here, for the families who mourn. This nation stands with the good people of New York City and New Jersey and Connecticut as we mourn the loss of thousands of our citizens. I can hear you! <laughs> I can hear you, the rest of the world hears you, and the people and the people who knock these buildings down will hear all of us soon. By pushing and compassion. Me. Sorry. No, 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 sorry. To everybody who is here. Line on that one. Thank you for your hard work. Thank you for making the nation proud. And may God bless America. Right, let's get back a little bit, folks. Give us some room. As if from the rubble, more stories of bravery and compassion continue to emerge. On Friday, Larry King spoke to U.S. Solicitor General Ted Olson about the loss of his wife, Barbara. She was aboard the plane that crashed into the Pentagon and made two calls to her husband. I think she must have been partially in, in, in shock from the fact that she was on a hijacked plane. She absorbed the information. We then at both reassured one another this plane was still up in the air, this plane was still flying, and, and this was going to come out okay. Um, I told her it's going to come out okay. She told me it was going to come out okay. She said, I love you. He says at one point, Barbara asked him what she should tell the pilot of the doomed plane to do. Olson was a 45-year-old lawyer who often appeared on CNN as a conservative commentator. Larry King also spoke to Michael Hingson, a blind man who worked on the 78th floor of the first World Trade Center tower that was hit. He paid tribute to his guide dog, Rizelle, for saving his life. She did a tremendous job. She's from Guide Dogs for the Blind, which is one of the, the larger schools in the country that, that trains these dogs. They do an incredible job of selecting the animals, doing the best that they can to acclimatize them to a lot of adverse conditions. This clearly can't be one of them, but she knows how to cope with noises. She knows how to cope with a lot of different stressful things. So she played mm -hmm. guide down the stairs. 
Hinkson and his dog escaped through the lobby and took shelter in a subway just as the building started to collapse. It's amazing, Jonathan. The enormity of Tuesday's attacks on New York often obscure the individual tolls taken on that day. Let's now take a moment to look at seven lives tragically cut short. <laughs> Lost on United Flight 175 from Boston, headed to Los Angeles. Ace Bailey, a Stanley Cup champion, the director of pro scouting for the LA Kings. It would have been his 32nd season working in the NHL. Mark Bavis was flying with him, a young King scout who played hockey for Boston University, where his twin brother is now assistant coach. Lisa Frost was a star student, graduating first in her class from Boston University this year. She was headed to see her parents, Tom and Melanie, and getting ready to start a new job next week in San Francisco. Sean Nassani and his girlfriend, Lynn Goodchild, took off for a vacation in Hawaii. They were active and athletic. He, especially, loved to run and ski. Ronald Gamboa managed a Gap store in Santa Monica. He and his longtime partner, Daniel Brandhorst, were headed back to California. With them, the son they had adopted together David Brandhorst. United Airlines 175 crashed into the World Trade Center on September 11, 2001 at 9.03 a.m. Eastern Time. As Americans mourn, they unite in many ways. CNN's Michael McManus now with how people are pulling together in different cities. Americans are pulling together and they're showing their resolve with American flags. In fact, manufacturers can't keep up with the orders. In Washington, Congress passes a flag resolution. Let each of us, as an aroused citizen of this democracy, show our solidarity as a nation by flying the stars and stripes from every flagpole, every home, and every business, school, in this great country. Advice a small California town heeds. It's comforting to know that people are all trying to pull together through this time of crisis. In Oklahoma, it's teddy bears that provide comfort. The stuffed animals collected will be sent to victims' families and rescue workers in New York and Washington. In Los Angeles, consolation in the warm glow of a candle just one of the countless vigils all across the U.S. as people express spirit and resolve during a difficult time. Michael McManus, CNN. Los Angeles, from Miami to Minnesota, from Burbank to Boston, the people of the U.S. have been lighting candles to remember those who perished. Let's take a glimpse now at a few of those vigils. I think this is just one sign of the unity and the solidarity. And it's, it's nice to know that what you feel, the pain and the hurt, is shared by a lot of people. There's a lot of people that are trying to make some good out of this. So I think it's important to share that with everybody. Young and old and people of all persuasions. And it's fantastic to see that we all have one thing in common, that we love this country. I think it was a big shock to everyone, and I think everyone was stunned at first, and I think we're all doing the best we can. I think it's absolutely amazing that the government is taking such a unified stance towards all of this. I mean, to see Mayor Giuliani, Hillary Clinton, and Governor Pataki all standing side by side in unity, I truly feel that they and President Bush are giving this city a strength that it has never seen before. 
weather forecasters say conditions in New York will improve today, giving a boost to rescue efforts. Work was hampered by rain on Friday. For the latest from New York, we go to Garrick Utley. Garrick. Good morning uh, from New York, Zane. But how do you give a boost um, to how people are feeling here? Given what happened in New York City uh, this week, it's not surprising that on Friday you didn't hear the old refrain, TGIF, thank God it's Friday, because simply on this weekend, Saturday morning, there's no way to really decompress. How do you escape from the realities of this week? Still, people will try to seek some kind of weekend relief. Here's our Beth Nissen. For most New Yorkers, it doesn't seem much like the start of a weekend. Still, in a week when so many people who went to work on Tuesday never came home, it was good to see the work week end. Many headed out of town for hastily arranged family gatherings. Jason Spiewak was taking Amtrak to his parents' home in Pennsylvania. I've just been stirred up all week by the, you know, the goings on. I just want to be close to family and friends. Brie McCallop was going home to Florida. I live by myself, and I, I really just don't want to be here right now. I just don't feel comfortable being here. I don't feel safe. Almost everyone understood the desire to get away from the unrelenting anguish and distress and fear to read about and think about something else, anything else. You'd almost want the new fall season on TV because, you know, it's, it's an escape. Everywhere you look is just inundated with the pictures that you've seen over and over and over, and it's 24-7. And you have to switch to something like Cartoon Network just to escape from it. In Times Square, hundreds of people lined up in the rain to buy half-price tickets to Broadway shows. Patricia McClellan was trying to get tickets to Beauty and the Beast for her two school-aged children. Trying to pick up their spirits and get them together and get them away from viewing everything that they've been looking at for the last week. After four days of almost unbearable real-life drama, many wanted to see a stage story with a clear resolution, a happy ending. Uh, the theater provides for us a little bit of release, a little bit of relief from what's going on. Um, we can't ever forget what's gone on here in New York. It's a great tragedy, but it gives us a little bit of a mental vacation. Those who went to New York City movie theaters seemed in search of the same thing. It's quite ironic that I'm choosing to go to the movies for two hours, considering this is like being in a movie. It's surreal. It's like a, a Hollywood horror film, and yet I'm looking for a film to kind of just take my mind away from it, you know. Legions of others just wanted to stay home. Some rented half a dozen videos. I've never rented a movie before. I just got a membership today because I plan on staying in the house all weekend. I'm not going to do anything because of the incident. Because of that horrible incident, NFL and college football games, a usual weekend release for thousands of sports-mad New Yorkers, were canceled. I wish I had the distraction to the release of the football season, but I understand as uh, playing football as uh, myself, um, the tension of what happened at the World Trade Center, I wouldn't want to play if I was a player. Not everyone wanted distraction. Some wanted a few hours of quiet to try to cope with the stun and the sorrow. A lot of people died and it, made, it broke my heart. It literally broke my heart. And I feel like crying right now. Millions of New Yorkers still need comforting. Many said they plan to attend religious services this weekend, go to temple tonight, mass tomorrow, or church on Sunday. The Marble Collegiate Church on Fifth Avenue has added a second service Sunday to accommodate what senior minister Arthur Caliandro expects will be standing room crowds. I think what people are looking for is sanctuary, a place to be where they're, they're safe emotionally and physically, but also that we're spiritually. But feeling safe again seems such a long way off for most New Yorkers, so much loss still uncounted. And for most people, nothing they can do except try their best to make it through tomorrow and the next day and a long succession of days after. Beth Nissen, CNN, New York. Of course, one of the most uh, favorite or popular weekend escapes is to go to the movie. And in the movie houses, the film's having the toughest time attracting uh, audiences probably this weekend. It'll be those action films filled with exploding cars and buildings. New Yorkers have had enough of that so far this week. Jane, Zane? Guy, New Yorkers trying to go back to normal, um, as it were. Will New York ever go back to what it once was? 
Well, of course it will. It hasn't really left that. This has been a, an exceptional week and may go on for another week or so. There are two parts to that, uh, two answers to that question. One is going to be the physical, how do you rebuild? And already there are people talking about what goes up in the place of the World Trade Center. It will be redeveloped, probably not with two soaring skyscrapers. There will be a lower profile. And as far as the emotional health of the city, it'll come back. Next week the stock market will be open, the ball games, the NFL will be playing the following weekend. It'll be painful, but the city comes back. Zane? What's, what, what's been most um, amazing to a lot of people, Garrick, is the way New Yorkers have pulled together to, to stand together in this moment of tragedy. What have people been saying to you about that? Well, they, everybody says, uh, talks to everybody else. Uh, this is a this city is different from many other American communities in that it's so densely packed. That's why people can often be very irritated and irritating, because uh, you can't escape the other person. We live in dormitories called apartment buildings, obviously. And because of that, we know um, we have this very intense uh, contact. What people were really saying was this sense of community, that this week, more than I've ever experienced, I've lived here for 20 years, this big city of 7 million people plus became a very small community of 7 million people plus. That's quite an achievement. The sad thing, of course, is um, what brought it about, the disaster on Tuesday. Garrett Cutley in New York, thank you so much. Jonathan. Those of us at a distance from New York, people around the world who have watched all of this unfold from a safe distance, are struck with the images, the final pictures that they had of all of this destruction. Some people had something more. They had final words. Delma Guterres reports. September 11th, American Airlines Flight 11 crashes into the North Tower. Jill Gartenberg's husband is inside. Stay tuned to CNN for more coverage of our, uh, our, our America's new war. I'm Zane Vergy. And I'm Jonathan Mann. Thanks for being with us. Uh, Where is the I'm Jonathan Mann at the CNN Center. Our coverage of America's new war continues. And I'm Zane Vergy at the CNN Center. You're looking now at uh, live pictures of uh, the Lower Manhattan, where the rescue operation is underway. And this is the Pentagon. Now you can see still the site of the crash. The black boxes have been recovered from the Pentagon, as they have been also from the crash site in Pennsylvania, just part of the clues numbering in the thousands that investigators from the National Transportation Safety Board and the FBI are trying to pursue. Rescue workers, as we saw in the picture there, are working around the clock, digging through mountains of destruction. There's been uh, rainy weather uh, that's, that's been hampering operations, but it appears as though the weather will improve, and uh, hopefully it, it will create a better environment to do that. But Jonathan, no survivors found in the last uh, couple of days. Um, hope, optimism is waning, but there are those families of, of victims that are, are hoping that something will come out of it. The rescue effort has been stymied, the realization setting in that perhaps there will be no rescue, but there is still the ongoing investigation. CNN's Mike Betcher brings us the latest on that. 4,000 special agents chasing 36,000 leads and circulating to 18,000 law enforcement agencies a growing list of people they want to question. The Federal Bureau of Investigation has also forwarded a list of more than 100 names to numerous law enforcement organizations. These are the names of individuals the FBI would, uh, the FBI would like to talk to because we believe they may have information that could be helpful to the investigation. Another FBI list, this one made public, the 19 men who the FBI says were the hijackers of the four aircraft. Seven of the men were pilots, according to CNN terrorism analyst Peter Bergen. Thirteen of them have recognizable Saudi tribal names from the west and southwest of Saudi Arabia, an area where